<laughs> you, you brought it up with the Timberwolves and the Lynx as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Why, why basketball? You're, you're, bro, you're one of the base, best baseball players ever. Ever to live. Ever to walk the earth <laughs> and you bought two basketball teams. Like when, I, like when I saw that come out, I was like, buy a baseball team. Why not? Well, let me tell you something. You know what I say. Game knows game, right? Yeah. And, and, and when I look at a young Anthony Edwards or, or Cat, mm -hmm. Or, or, or D -Lo. I, I know what it, I know what a champion looks like, and, and, and you guys do too, right? Because you look at another athlete in the eye, and it transcends sports. It is really about this, it's about this, it's about this, right? right. And that's really important. Then, then I looked at the landscape of, you know, it's funny, um, my, one of my heroes, Magic, NBA legend, yeah. ends up with a baseball team with the Dodgers. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am, I played 25 years of baseball, and I end up with an NBA team. But when you look at the NBA, there's so many things that they're doing right. No, no, number one thing they're doing is all they care about is growing the pie as big as possible, and then they split it right down the middle. So there's no labor issues now, in the future, or ever. So all we're trying to do is, like, I mean, it's simple, it's four of us. Let's grow this freaking pie as big as possible. I'm gonna take a quarter, you take a quarter, you take a quarter, and then we're all aligned. And when that phone rings, we're all gonna be helping each other, right? and we have this good energy. It's not, so the NBA has a great business plan. Yeah. Number two, it has great leadership. Adam Silver, uh, Mark Tatum, they just do an incredible job. When they're faced with challenges, they face them head on. They take a negative into a, a positive. You see how um, Adam Silver handled uh, the Donald Sterling situation. Boom, Steve Ballmer ends up with a team. Um, anytime there's a situation, BLM, you name it, they're always out in front right message, they're not afraid, it's a global sport. Look, I, I gotta bribe my girls to come to a baseball game these days, which breaks my heart. My first love is baseball. And, but they don't wanna sit there for four hours, right? Basketball game, we're there for two hours and 15 minutes. We're having dinner and a cocktail at 9.30. Yeah. A lot of action, right? <laughs> yeah. right? So, so uh, there's a lot of tailwinds in the NBA. I, I actually think that if you look at the landscape of the NBA and the NFL, you won't be able to acquire an NFL or an NBA team for less than $5 billion in the next 15 to 20 years. Oh, yeah. Because when I look at the, the investments that you spoke about, you talk about real estate, you talk about basketball. Essentially, a basketball team is not necessarily real estate, but it's like real estate, right? Yeah. There's a real estate component. Right. Uh, what, what you'll find and what I try to invest in is things that uh, have tailwinds, uh, that have a big TAM, meaning it has a huge market, right? Mm -hmm. Real estate, NBA, um, and they all generate a lot of cash, right? right? And, and it's really very little speculation. Like, honestly, like if you can't explain it to me in the back of the envelope in less than two <laughs> minutes, then I, then I ain't that freaking smart. You lost me. Break it down to me right. easy, right? Break it down to me basic. And you look at the NBA, is growing 15 to 17% a year. There's young audience all over the world. It's a global sport. It's fun, right? And, and we got to keep things fun. In this world, where TV contracts are going, if you keep it fun and entertaining, and my daughter's going to walk in, it, I can't keep her attention for more than six seconds. Right. So <laughs> you think about a four-hour game, it's a challenge. You look at, you know, you're talking about a four-hour game, um, also the incredibly long seasons, you guys being on the road a ton of time. You know, what, what did you learn from the adversities of, of baseball, whether it be individually on a team, understanding the losses? Because we sit here, and if you read through Alex Rodriguez's bio, it looks like a ton of wins, right? I'm sure if we got an opportunity to look at your portfolio, it would be a ton of wins. But there had to be some things that taught you lessons along the way. What are some of those situations that you said, okay, you know what, Alex, this is something I can learn from, be better about, and help somebody going forward? Yeah, I mean, look, I have a huge portfolio of losses, right? A huge. Um, I'm fifth all time in the history of the game. Fifth in the history of strikeouts, right? <laughs> so that means four peak channing. Four people. I know you're good at math. Hey, why are you looking at me? Hey, hey, this Fred, is crazy. Freddie T can't this do the math. Channing can do it. <laughs> wait, wait. So, so, I so thought if, he was going in a different right? direction. No, no, I moment. wasn't. I wasn't. So if I'm fifth, that means that only four cats in the history, four cats in the history of mankind have struck out more than me. Right. So I got a PhD in failing folks. I know how to fail better than anybody. But I always tell my daughters, you know, I have a master's in getting back up. And the thing about failing 
it, it's not about failing, it's how you handle failure and how do you learn from those lessons and how do you dust off and get back to the box and say, you know what, this time I'm gonna do it. But do it where you feel like you're still gonna get it done. Because doing it to doing it, that ain't doing it. You gotta come out with the mentality, you kick my ass, but I'm coming back up. And I always think about the movie Rocky, and I'll never forget the scene where Apollo, mm -hmm. Apollo feels like he's got him knocked out, knocked out, knocked out, and he's kind of over there celebrating, and he thinks he has him knocked out, and when he looks back at Rocky, he's still coming, and you saw his face where Apollo says, oh shit, yeah. this mother is different. And I always want to be like Rocky, right? Like, you can punch me, you can knock me, you can count me out, but man, that's fuel to my soul. And uh, my, fir my first year, I said my freshman year, my first year, I got demoted five times. The fifth time I called my mom, I was 18 years old, I said, mom, what the f man? I'm, I remember I had a little Beamer 525, I thought I was a baller, right? <laughs> they five, took my ass five down to- 525? Yeah, 525. Tiny one? They, no, it was the middle one. <laughs> the, 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 three, the 325 was tiny, <laughs> oh, okay. but, but I went middle, I went, I went middle. 1.35, you know, I, 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 I got a stretch, but it was used, it was used, <laughs> and I got a good deal, I negotiated the hell out of that. But, but I was, they took my ass down to, to Tacoma, and Lupinella said, we're gonna send your ass down. I said, Lou, for the fifth time? He said, yeah, you know, you gotta adjust with your strikeouts, and you gotta make the plays. So I'm going down to Tacoma uh, from Seattle, it's about 45 minute ride, tears. Um, I, that was the time where you get that speaker phone in your car for the first time. So I, I call mom, I wake her ass up, and it's, it's like three in the morning back home, because I'm in Seattle, she's in Miami. And she, I said, mom, you know what? This is what they talk about, plan B. You know, I still got that scholarship at the University of Miami. I'm gonna go throw the rock and be a quarterback. And I can't play baseball because I burned that. And she goes, you gotta be out of your mind. I said, first of all, you better toughen up. And that's not the boy that I raised. And I said, number two, if you bring come home, I'm gonna f change the lock on the door. <laughs> so I didn't have a choice to come home. Yeah. And, and, and that kind of got me going. And then of course I served the suspension in 2014. And that was the longest suspension in Major League Baseball history for PD use. And that was, that, was the, that was the blow that I thought was gonna take me out, right? That was like the blow that landed. Right, and, and it was such a, such a humiliating uh, part of my life because I let down so many people. Started with my mother and my two daughters, first and foremost. And that was a perfect example of, of overreaching and surrounding myself with the wrong people. And when I looked at that suspension and, and the time off, I was hoping that it would be a 50 game suspension like the other guys, but ended up being a full season. And, and what happened was that was a blessing in disguise. Right. And the reason why is I was able to, um, you know, sometimes you put, uh, you fix the windows in a house and you fix the roof and get the landscape. I needed to tear the whole house down and start one brick at a time. And because I needed that time, it gave me the full year to go back and turn the lens inward and, and go into deep therapy. And uh, Dr. David out in Colorado, uh, who's no longer with us, saved my life because I would go for four days intensive and it would be from nine in the morning to five in the afternoon with no break, no lunch break. You better bring a donut or something. And I, I, had, I really got an understanding of why I kept making the mistakes that I was making, uh, imploding right? And I'm like, I'm the only jackass. I told him, this is how I started my therapy. I'm the only jackass that has pocket aces. God gives me pocket aces and I end up losing the hand and I ended up beating up myself and I would wake up in the middle of the night like, what the f have I done? Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pinning it. I thought they hear the witnesses. 